Yer, what's good, my babies? Welcome back. Welcome back to my channel. I am Tatiana Tarot, Tarot Diviner, Spiritista, y el Orisha of the Sheshe tradition, mommy, subtle energy practitioner, healer, spiritual educator, whatever. I do all the things. So, I'm so happy to be back because finally I am doing that video y'all been asking me for for almost a year now since I've moved to Bali. It will be a year at the end of August, so that time is coming up around the corner real quick. I'm going to give you the 411 on all of the questions that you guys have asked me on my Instagram DMs. If you're not following me on Instagram, please hit me up over there at Tatiana Tarot, T-A-T-I-A-N-N-A-T-A-R-O-T. For more juicy info about me and a bunch of other content that is more tarot related. Okay. Um, Y'all sent me some really interesting questions about my stay in Bali. And I'm here to finally answer them. Okay. I am definitely going to go in depth because there's 20 something questions. I don't know if I'm going to hit all of them. But they will be touched on. Okay. I'm going to get into it. Um, also, you know, a lot of these questions have inspired the desire for me to create kind of like a mini series vlog situation so i am going to be doing that as new content in my possessed your spirit membership if you're not yet a member i have a sale for the month of june so this is the last week for you to take advantage of that sale it's going to be 20 percent off the first three months you get enrolled okay using the code hot h-o-t summer s-u-m-m-a h-o-t s-u-m-m-a in the checkout go get that done the link is down below and you're gonna get a bunch of content as is on spiritual education clearing your energy fields um, bringing in more wealth and abundance visiting and opening up your akashic records past life regressions timeline jumping ancestral healing um divination practice even if you don't even know how to divine or use the cards or do mediumship we do that all in the group and so um yeah, so let's get into the questions, okay? Because there's a lot, like I say, that I got them all. I wrote them down in my in my notes. So, okay, the first question that I did not write down, but it's the main question that everybody's been asking me, is why did I move to Bali? What inspired me to move to Bali? What happened there? Because um, if, for those that don't know me, um... I am a Brooklyn girl. I'm a New York girl. You could probably hear it in my accent. I've been born and well, I wasn't born there, but I was raised since before I was one there. <laughs> okay. And so, um, I've been there my whole life. I've traveled a lot and about seven years ago, I moved to New Orleans. So I've been in seven, I've been in New Orleans for the past seven years. Um, I had gotten married there. I got divorced there. I had my baby there, raised her there. And, um, I've been there practically this whole time. And then about a year ago, I was like, all right, it's time to move to Bali. Bali's always been on my radar. If you are a close friend of mine, you know about me. I've been talking about Bali since I, I you could probably scroll back in some of my videos that I used to do back in the day in my 20s. And you could probably hear me talking about Bali just as I was talking about New Orleans before I moved there. So I had always felt the pull, the energetic pull, um, the spiritual pull to move to Bali. When I move someplace, it isn't because I personally desire to move there. Um, it's usually an, a spiritual pull. It's usually like my spirits are calling me there for a reason. So this has been in, in, the, in the works for many years. I have booked many flights to Bali and had to cancel it um, because of timing or because of uh the pandemic okay last time i booked a flight um, um omarion came back around town omicron came back around town and bali closed up so i said okay i mean i know this is a portal just as new orleans is a portal can nobody just come to new orleans when they want to like it opens up to you at the right time and it closes at the right time too and so for me, I was I was always diligent on doing my research before moving here. I watched a lot of YouTube videos. I researched a lot of articles. I looked into a lot of travel agency articles and stuff online. And um, when it came time to it, my actual move to Bali was not intentional. Like it wasn't like, okay, I really want to move to Bali now. It was more like I woke up. Two years ago, 
January and was like, I need to move from New Orleans. I, I just felt like this spiritual agitation, like I need to move. For me, it didn't make any logical sense because I love New Orleans. I had been living in a home in there. I was real cozy. My daughter was real cozy. She just got into an exceptional school. Um, I had a lot of close friends. Um, you know, I had my routine. I was taking a lot of dance classes. You know, my favorite places to go and eat. Um, so I was good. I was comfortable. I was live loving it. Me and my cat, my baby, you were great. And then I woke up that January and was like, oh, we got to go. We got to go. It just felt like you need some move, right? And so that was the year that my lease was going to be renewed. And so I had some time to think about where I would want to go. At that point, I was not thinking about leaving the States. I was thinking about living still somewhere in the States, but in the South. That kind of gave me the New Orleans vibe, but could be a little bit safer and just felt more energetically conducive to what I was feeling pulled to go to, which was not very clear at that time. So what I had done was just sit and pray on it. I was like, I know spirit, you're telling me to move. Um, I know ancestors, I feel the call to move. I just don't know where, you know, give me a sense of direction, give me a sign. Um, I need clarity on this because the, the, the I just don't know how to say it. Like it, it was almost borderline not anxiety driven, but it was like an urgency. Like if you don't move in the next couple of months, not that something bad was going to happen, but it's like, it's time to, you have fun here. It's time to wrap it up. Time for your next mission type of stuff. So I actually did a little bit of a hopping around the States um, to see where I would want to live. And when I traveled to those places, um, and I got the sign to go to those places when I was there the places met my expectations They exceeded my expectations, but it didn't feel energetically, right? It was like yeah, I definitely need to move here at some point. Yes, my signs were correct My spirits were correct, but I don't need to move here now like later 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 on I see this in my trajectory, but not now so that really threw me off <laughs> Because I was like, where do I want to go? Like, I don't want to live in Florida. I don't want to live in Texas. I don't want to go back to New York. I don't want to live in California. I don't want to live in, in Georgia, Atlanta. Like, I don't, like, don't want to live in Chicago. Um, and I also don't want to live in Bumblefuck. Like, going to Ohio. No offense if you guys live in Ohio or, like, Oklahoma or Missouri or whatever. Uh, big up to y'all. But, like, I was like, I just don't want to go there either. So, at this point... I had to go back to the drawing board. I was like, where do I really, where, where does my heart really want to go? Um, I was thinking about the Caribbean, but yet it didn't feel aligned either. And at this point I had like one month to make a decision because I would have to renew my lease for a year and stay in New Orleans for a year. And I got it. I was like, oh my God, why don't I just move to Bali? Why don't I just move to Bali? And I thought that that was a very far-fetched, insane idea. I was in the midst of launching a course again. If anybody does any digital marketing, online coursework, you know that launching a course is a lot of work. A lot, a lot of work. Okay, not only am I teaching this course, recording modules, doing the content to do the marketing, writing the emails, taking care of my child as a single parent, trying to take care of myself, pack all my things, sell all my things, accommodate a new life in a new country, navigate in, in a country I've never been to. I was like, this is insane. Um, but I talked to my family about it. They kind of know that I roll with the punches and can be rather impulsive, but they were really excited about the prospect of me moving because at least they're like, you'll be safe. Go ahead and live your best life. Get out of the States, <laughs> you know? So I did it. I literally had less than a month to do all that stuff, including selling my car, which was probably one of the hardest things that you could do in less than a month. Like no one hears about selling your car in less than a month. And I did it in three days. <laughs> I was like, okay, so 
my family is like, well, shit, if you sold your car in three days, then that's a sign that you need to get. <laughs> so that's basically the story of me coming to Bali. It's just always been a seed in my brain. Um, it's always been an intention, but that intention was definitely activated and driven even further. Even before I left, like I do a lot of work as a spiritista, I get a lot of, uh, do a lot of work with my bovina, my altars, I talk to spirits, I work with different types of spirits and elementals, and a lot of the spirits from Bali were coming through elemental spirits. I checked in with a lot of my mentors. I checked in with myself. So this is something that, yes, it was kind of impulsive, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't, it wasn't careless. It wasn't a careless move, right? I did check in with a lot of my spirits and my Orishas and stuff. And so it was a thumbs up. So, um, and I'm grateful and I'm, I love it here. And there's a lot, a lot of things that I miss back home. It's a lot of pros and cons and living out here, but that's basically what, what brought me to Bali. I never had that fear of, um, in doing all my research, I knew what the quality of living out here was like. I knew the safety. Um, I had hired a relocation specialist to kind of help me narrow down where in Bali I would want to live, where the best schools were, uh, how I could find a nanny and childcare, um, how I could get established, like where, where can I get a, a villa and all of that stuff. So, I mean, I'm a Virgo. A lot of you guys are asking me this question, these questions, but no one was here to help me. I didn't see, you don't have a lot of videos of black expats living in Bali. And if you do, it's really insubstantial. It's tourist stuff that is really not important for a person who's actually gonna move there. So I would implore you guys to do your research because that's what I did. I was on Googles, I was on YouTube. I said, expats living in Bali. Try to get all the resources. There's a lot of Bali blogs. Um, I think it's called the Honeycombers Bali Edition. Um, the company that I hired as a relocation specialist, they did their job for what they had to do. Um, I definitely overpaid and I definitely did not get along with the host, so I'm not going to recommend them. It could have just been like, I'm very direct for New Yorker, they're not from the country, they were not with the shits you know, or, or just misunderstanding what I was asking for. I feel like I'm very direct and clear. So the quality of what I was expecting for the service was subpar. So I'm not going to recommend and tell you guys to support them. But should I come across anybody that is a relocation specialist here in Bali, I will definitely link that down below. Um, also, I am going to be hosting a retreat in Bali real soon um next year most likely and so if you want to experience bali for yourself please place yourself on the waiting list in the link down below any information about bali place yourself in the waiting list down below you will get more information on that in the months to come but yeah that's my bali story it is really kind of like what bring and i even when i first came to bali and i'll get into this in a little bit People are like, well, what brought you to Bali? What pulled you to Bali? You know, like the spirits, the calling, the relationship with the land. Uh, I connected with all that before I moved. So it wasn't like I was like on my Carmen San Diego tip as a single mom, just kind of risk it all or nothing. Um, I'm very fortunate in the sense that um, it's it, like everybody's saying it's so brave for you to move as a single mom. And. I guess this, I guess I guess it is very brave, but for me, it's just a way of living. I'm very nomadic by nature. I had moved a lot in my twenties. I traveled a lot. I lived overseas for over a year um, in Egypt. So this is not new to me. Um, and so, and my daughter has been traveling internationally since she was five months. Sahara's with the shit. Sahara's like, what? Every time she sees me with the luggage, she's like, okay, let's go. Jet set, let's go. Plane, I want to drive it. So, <laughs> I want to fly it. So, I'm very fortunate that she's one of those kids that's a natural explorer. Um, and, you know... Yeah, why not? You only have one life to live, right? Be a pioneer. Be a pioneer. So that I'll see. It, so the first question is, the second question really, 
what is, what's your impression on the local spiritual practice? So, um, Bali is an island in Indonesia. Bali is not a country. A lot of people come here and think it's a country. It is, they've got what? 13,000 islands or 17,000 islands that make up Indonesia. And Bali is just one of the most popular ones. Um, so the locals here are a, a combination of they're Muslims, they're Christians, but they're predominantly Hindus. And so you're going to see a lot of Hindu statues, a lot of temples, a lot of religious holidays that um, are practiced by them. And so um, immediately you do feel um, amazingly well when you land. You feel Zen, you feel peaceful. There's a lot of reverence. There, um, there are they uh, the the Balinese are a people that really respect and and revere their ancestors. They revere the land. They revere the spirits of the land and the elementals. So there are offerings that are made at least three ty times a day. You will see them with and I forget the name of it, but it is almost like this little packet of flowers, incense, a cigarette, money, and you will see them on the street, on the buildings, on the scooters, in your home. They'll leave them in your home. You'll see little temples in your home. Um, you'll see them in businesses. And so I think for the fact that, you know, there is just so much respect, there's so much mindfulness to towards the spiritual life and, and the spirit that encompasses all and energy that you do feel that sort of elated vibration when you get on the island. You feel much more peaceful. You feel much more connected to nature. You feel safer. Um, you feel uh, definitely that sort of respect that they show. Um, so it's very beautiful because it does feel like you're at home in terms of my heart. It feels like this is these are my spiritual practices as a, a practitioner of the African diaspora. Um, ancestral veneration is so important for us um, and it's something that we do not just like one time a day so is there our altar but it's like in any sheshe in the Aruba practice of Ifa Orisha ancestral veneration is a way of life you you have venerate your ancestors through your personal conduct and your character and 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 how you treat others and so the locals are very kind. The locals are very sweet, especially, especially to children. They love children. They adore and worship children. Children are a big blessing here. Um, and so that is seen and that is felt in and through your interactions with them. They're kind. They're gracious. It's a slower pace of living. There's more sensuality here in the sense that people take their time and so coming from a Western world, that can be a little irritating for us that are used to getting things done diligently, rapidly, at a specific time. It's almost time doesn't exist here. I think in some areas that are more Western on the island, because we do have a lot of Western influences, especially with the expats making a lot of businesses and setting up here, you do have that feel of merging the two worlds together, but still very much, there's a lot of spaces and places on the island that are like, it's, it's a time portal, it's a time warp. I mean, if you think about it, it's anywhere from 24 hours, the fastest flight to like 30 plus to get here from the US, um, and it's about 12 to 15 hours ahead of the States right and so we're really in the future <laughs> we're in the future and you can feel that you can feel that uh if you're very sensitive to energy you can get that sensation um and that sentiment of time being warped a bit okay so how is your routine question number two three how is your routine different from where you live in the u.s I think the biggest thing for us expats, us digital nomads that live here that are from the US is the time difference. Because I run a business, so that means I teach classes or I have to have meetings with some of my team members that are in the States, you know, accountant, lawyer, bookkeepers, et cetera, et cetera, team meeting with other business partners. And that means that, you know, when it's when it's 9, 10, 11, 12 in the afternoon or morning for you guys over there, I got to be up at that time in the nighttime. If there is a meeting that is at 3 p.m. in the United States, I got to be up here at 3 in the morning 
four in the morning right and so um a lot of us have that kind of switch where normally people in the u.s would be working in the day contingent of whether or not they own a business because then you can make your own hours and that gets switched over here i have a lot of friends here that are digital nomads or they don't own their business some of them own their businesses some of them don't and they're just able to work from abroad and we all gotta be up <laughs> okay we all gotta be up at the crack of dawn and sometimes that's that's it could be a little frustrating because let's say you're going to a party over here on saturday and it's still friday in the united states so you can't really go out and party <laughs> you know 9 10 11 12 1 a.m here on a saturday and it's that time in the in the you know in in the united states um on a friday so that could be a little tricky you know it could be a lot of a little tricky i've known some friends that have had some difficulties like that um but the routine is a slower pace it is much more less stressful over here um it, you know one of the things that is beautiful about bali is you have that um island feel right so everything is grown from the ground you go to local markets um everything is fresh and um sourced locally or um things can be a little challenging sometimes to get because they're imported um amazon doesn't come out here we have variations of amazon like tokopedia um and shopee and stuff like that that you can't find in the states but amazon don't come out here um some places do do food delivery okay but it's not like um instacart <laughs> so i mean after the pandemic we were so used to ordering everything and not going anywhere so that became a luxury for us in the states and it's like sometimes when you ripping and running you run in a business and you you're on these calls or you're making all, all of this content for your business or you're rectifying accounts and you're cooking for your child you're doing this nobody got the time to go to the supermarket for an hour and a half two hours go shop and come back all that stuff you want to order that and have that delivered to your house here i don't have that luxury so, so i will be going to the markets myself a lot because i'm a little traditional and i like that i like you know, just being a hands-on mom and going out and getting my groceries and, and getting things. So sometimes I'll send the housekeeper or the nanny to do that because that is a luxury that we have over here that is a way of life, having a nanny or, or a housekeeper that comes along with your rent here, okay? And so that too is a little different. How we pay things, you know, banking systems is a little different. Um, but for the most part, everything is everything else kind of stays the same. Um, I would say there's more time and we have the luxury of doing things that are more luxurious than and, and, and cost effective than they would be in the States. Like you can get an hour massage for five, six dollars here that would cost you maybe eighty dollars, a hundred dollars or more in the States, right? You can get your hair did for Seventy dollars that would cost you with the hair that will cost you three hundred dollars, two hundred dollars in the states without buying the hair, right? And so there's a lot of things here that kind of remain the same that need to be twerked and adjusted, and a lot of things that um, are not. So number four is what is your favorite city city in Bali? And I think, and I don't spend a lot of time here, but I did feel a very strong pull to Uluwatu, which I want to say is on the east side of the island. Uluwatu is known for its high cliffs and serene um, uh, oceans. Um, there is a, a beach club that is it's like the go-to if you want to see the hottest DJs. In fact, yesterday, Little John came there. Um, and so they tend to have like uh, rappers come, artists come, a lot of African DJs come. Okay, and Uluwatu is like a surfer city. It's a beach city. Um, it's got a. It's, it, it can be a little luxurious. It's got really amazing restaurants and cafes 
and the scenery is there. It's much more peaceful. It's not as chaotic as it is kind of on the west side, which is where I'm situated. Um, but it is, I love spending time there whenever I go. There's a space, there's a spot there that is kind of like, um, all for one spa. It has like crypto, what do you call cryotherapy. It has a sauna, it has a heat room, uh, a sun lounge, all that stuff. So, so once in a blue moon, I go there. Once in a blue moon, I go to eat there. There are some clubs and things to do there, but I haven't really taken the time because it, it, it is like an hour to go there. Oh, and that's something I would say. Traffic is crazy out here, okay? You don't want to get in the car because getting in a car to go anywhere will take you a long time. Something that would normally take you five, 10 minutes to get to could take an hour plus in a car or with crazy, crazy traffic. Don't matter where you're going. Traffic is insane. So that's why you see all of us going on a scooter, a motorbike. Some people go on motorcycles um, and we have our version of Uber and Lyft called Gojek and you pay 50 cents to go maybe 30 minutes somewhere, right? Is that cheap? And so we're in the back of the scooter with our helmets living, living free or like most of my friends, they've learned how to drive a bike. I have not learned how to drive a bike um, yet. I've gotten some classes, but I was like, all right, I don't know if I want to do this. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that is, the traffic is insane and, and that's why people prefer scooters because the roads, we don't have a lot of roads. It's, we don't have highways here. Usually it's like one road to get to one place. Ain't no like three different shortcuts to go to. So if everybody's taking that one road to get to that one part of town, it is going to be buku traffic. So the scooters kind of can cut and maneuver and drive past the cars and go straight down but even so it is a condensed area the roads are condensed and some parts of bali wherever you go it could be very rainy it could be very crowded it could be hilly it could be crazy it could be muddy so you gotta be very careful it's definitely very much giving what's that um temple run It's very much giving temple run that's that's like that's basically bali <laughs> like, driving through bali is temple run that game number five do people speak a lot of English um, yes a lot of people speak English here they may not speak it well but there is a lot of effort in speaking English um, the local language for the Balinese here is Bahasa Indonesian and um, it is not very difficult to learn so a lot of us will learn like foggy good morning or hello um or makasi which is thank you um and some other things like numbers and whatnot a lot of my friends are much more fluent than i am the kids if you see the kids moving here they will learn from their nannies they will learn from their friends and so um they a lot of them do speak english the um the locals that are much more westernized or have western friends or um indonesians that live maybe outside of bali you can see that they speak a little bit more. They have more experience in speaking English as well. Um, and so if you don't understand or there's a language barrier, what we tend to do is use, use Google Translate on our phones too. Um, so that's been great, great help. What's it like dating? What's it like? What's dating like there as a woman of color? A black woman. Child is ghetto. I don't know what to tell you. So, it's, you know, Bali, okay, so when I first moved to Bali, I, I wasn't prepared for it to be so white. I knew that there wasn't a lot of black people here, and I'm going to talk to you more about that in a second. Um, but I didn't think it was going to be this white, honey. So, and I just, I only date black men. That's all I've ever dated. And, um, yeah, I mean, I have fun. I have dated amazing men here. And I've dated some men that are, like, questionable. Um, but dating here in general, you're not going to find much because no one's coming here to live. 
if you're someone that's dating on the, you, you're like living on the island, you want something substantial, you want something long lasting, it may present itself as a challenge if you only want to date black men. Um, because there's just a very, very limited amount. I have amazing friends, three amazing friends that run the business called Black and Bali. Shout out to my homies, okay? Jana, Antoine, and Dharma. They are these uh, amazing people that are from the States originally, been living in Bali for many years, and they've created a community um, hosting monthly events, meetups, get ups, community um, service events, a variety of things for black people of the diaspora. Just no matter where you're from, you could be from from Africa, you can be from France, you can be from the Caribbean, you can be from the U.S., you can be, you know, from all over. If you're coming to Bali, they will, you know, you can join Black and Bali on Facebook, on Instagram, just as it is at Black in Bali, or check out blackinbali.com. You can see the events that they have hosted for that month. We have uh, Sunday brunches, meet-up dinners, open mics, clubbing experiences, birthday experiences. Um, if you want to contribute back to the community, community service experiences, okay? We have meetups for the ladies that just live on the island. We have meetups for the fellas that live on the island, right? And so through Black and Bali, you get to meet a lot of black people, but most of the time they are in transit. They're here for a week or two, they're here for six months or three months, but it's really, really a small pocket of us that are actually living, living here as long-term expats, right? So it can be difficult. Um, and a lot of people that are already here are already shacked up. They're either booed up or they're married right and so um it's really really interesting so if you need to be open-minded so if you if you like a lot of white people you know we have a lot of white people from europe we have a lot of you know russians ukrainians eastern europeans um we have a lot of australians right we've got some french we've got some italians and stuff like that um because they're also trying to take advantage of the quality of life um and the cost of living that is comparable to where we're originally from, right? And so when Bali opened back up, it kind of fell along the same timing as like the Russian-Ukrainian war situation that was going on. So they came over here <laughs> to get away from that mess too. And so did a lot of other people that were just tired and exhausted from the pandemic and just wanted to... Um, just wanted to live a better way of life. They, they want to explore. They want uh, to move. And so you, you get an influx of that. And that's not what I expected. Okay. But that being said, I'm still meeting men that are, you know, that maybe live locally. They could live in Singapore. They could be visiting Thailand. Or maybe they live in Jakarta. Um, there are a lot of professionals that come. There are a lot of people that are in uh, finance and economics. Or um, uh, they have online businesses. Um, or they own travel agencies and stuff like that. So I definitely say bear in mind that the selection is very small. But never say never. Okay, you never know who you'll meet when, you never know who's willing to move for you, you never know what people's conditionings are. So, um, I have a lot of friends that, you know, they love dating. Um, they're, they're black women, they love dating black men. Or they're queer and so there's also a, a very, very, very small selection of the queer community here. But um, they're very tight knit and they seem to be doing well. And I think they would agree with me too. One of my homeboys is like, yes, yeah, it's, it's the same predicament. In fact, one of, one of the friends that I know here, he moved. Um, he moved to South Africa and is having a better time with the dating situation out there. Um, and we had discussions about this. So, so you know, I definitely stay open if that's your cup of tea. But also never say never. Never say never, because you never know. Food spots. All right. Um, so you can find a nice, really interesting mix of Western restaurants, Italian, African restaurants. Honey, we've got a Nigerian restaurant that is just bomb. We have Italian restaurants, Spaniard restaurants. Um, what we don't have, I think we 
one just opened up a Caribbean restaurant that I want to say is is Guyanese so they just had like rotis it's like a roti joint I have yet to try it but my friend said on her Instagram that she liked it thumbs up and I believe she's Jamaican so I believe her um and a new Caribbean spot that was selling jerk chicken opened up too I need to see where they're at that one's much closer to where I live but so these are two new Caribbean spots and like the only ones on the island but the rest you could really find a lot of dope French restaurants just uh, cuisines from around the world um and of course Indonesian food is just bomb I love it it is rich in flavor it is so tasty they know how to season their food so good they cook with a lot of spices so if you like spicy hot stuff I love spicy hot stuff. This is for you. They cook with uh, a, a, a different types of meats and fishes and eggs and 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 vegetables and all that. is is It's just so savory. And so uh, local restaurants that are native are called warums. They're called warums, and that's where you're gonna get your money worth. Cause honey, you can have a whole buffet cuisine for five dollars each meal, including your drink. And it will really save you a lot of money, right? If you go to the Western re restaurants, depending on where you go to, sometimes it's a little bit cheaper than what you can find in the States. But for the most part, you're going to be paying very similar prices. Another thing about Bali is that it is a Muslim island. It's a Muslim, Indonesia is a Muslim country predominantly. So um, luckily, alcohol isn't illegal here, but it's taxed up the wazoo. So you're going to be paying if you go out to the clubs and stuff or you want to buy a bottle, you're going to be paying just as much as you would pay in the States, if not more. You're going to be paying like, why is this drink $12, $15? Like, why? <laughs> you know? So that is something that we've definitely had discussions about, me and my friends, and you need to be on the... And, and it's like... And they don't pour heavy handed, honey. They pour like a shot in a, mm, yeah. So you gotta know where to go and you gotta know where to pregame and stuff like that. But um, the food is delicious on the island. I cannot complain, all right? Um, a lot of these questions are redundant. So are you there as a visitor or a permanent resident? So I have um, a visa that recognizes me as a permanent resident for a couple of years. Um, so that visa lasts a couple of years. It's not hard to get visas. It is kind of like a lengthy process and it, it can be costly, but um, it's worth it. It allows me to fly back and in, in and out with ease with my child um, and get perks as a local on the island. Uh, and enroll my child in international schools here on the island with ease. And so there's that. How do they treat black women and people? So the locals love us. The locals love us. Um, a lot of people, you know, I, a lot of people don't, don't experience racism here as we would maybe like in China <laughs> and other parts of Asia. Um, because the Balinese are brown. Like if you Google Balinese people, they're brown. They're like a lot of them are darker than me. So, and there's parallels in our culture. Like we do ancestral veneration, you know, we're about family, we're about community, where we, you know, there's a lot of celebration in song and dance. Um, there's, there's happiness, there's joy, there's this appreciation of having these people that love and appreciate the culture and also are bringing in opportunity for them to work because there was nothing going on during the pandemic so they're very happy to have us here um so we don't see any sort of racism going on there have been few minor cases with a lot of the expats coming in um so the racism and any sort of uh, uh, prejudice that you would experience wouldn't be from the locals per se. It would be from the other expats that are on the island. So other Eastern Europeans that might like look at you a type of way or say something snarky. But even that has been very minimum um, from what I've heard. Um, so number 13, how much to live there? 
So Bali, because because everyone and their mama's living here too, the market, the housing market has hiked up, honey. The housing market has hiked up. Um, the cost of doing certain things that were once inexpensive are not not so much the case anymore. So, I mean, this, this question, it really depends on where on the island you're living and what your lifestyle is. And if you want a one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, if you want a villa with a, 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 a pool, where is the villa situated? Because there are some hot spots. Like if you living in Changu on the west side, Changu is like, I want to say it's like the Williamsburg of Bali. Um... Everybody and their mama want to be there. That's where all the hot restaurants are. That's where the hot beaches are. That's where the nightclubs are. That's where there's a lot of shopping going on. Um, and spas and things like that. And so, um, if you want to live there, then it's going to be pricey. I mean, I would say like average is now like 2000 a month. 2000 a month. You can absolutely negotiate like 2000 a month for what? Like two bedrooms maybe? I want to say. Um... And I could be wrong. Um, I don't want to give how much. I'm not paying $2,000 a month. I'm paying way less for that. For two bedrooms in a very, very um, high-end, sought-out neighborhood. But that's very residential for families. But that's because I got freaking lucky. I had been searching for months before I found the right villa. I've been searching online, on Facebook groups is what you want to do. Or talking to agents. And you're looking and it's like dog eat dog because you and 50 other people are trying to compete for the same villa. So you got to get ready to throw down that money and sign that lease right away. You go in, you inspect everything, you ask, you know, how much is this for a year? Where, are they willing to take this? You can negotiate, right? You can negotiate, but also bear in mind that there are other people trying to get the same villa as you. Um, and you don't got all day. To be, you know, hopping around the island looking for a good villa is very, 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 very competitive. Um, you know, when I was enrolling my daughter in one of the schools, I think the principal was like, wow, you you caught a villa in a neighborhood that you probably caught the last villa for that price, honey. Because ain't nobody, ain't nobody paying those prices in that neighborhood, honey. That, um, that, that rose up, skyrocketed. So, a thing about Bali over here is that, um, so, so, you know, you can also go to hostels and little things like that and make it more affordable, but it really does depend on what you're looking for. I would say budget anywhere from like maybe $1,200 to $2,000 and up. Um, and that is going to come for the most part with internet. That is going to come with a housekeeper. That is going to come with a gardener and a pool cleaner if you have that. Um, some that is sometimes it's going to come with water included. Now, if you don't want those amenities, then the rent will go down. Um, if you pay for a year ahead, you have more leverage to uh, you negotiate the price. If you're looking to pay for monthly, then your rent is going to be higher than paying for a year ahead. So what I did is just pay for a year ahead, boom, and knock down the price tremendously. Um, but not everybody has the luxury of doing that because where you know if you're coming from the states nobody pays a year ahead you pay monthly da, 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 and it's at least like that so those are the things you need to consider if you're thinking about moving here then i would definitely go google a lot of bali groups online um villas for rent in bali um, look at different neighborhoods. Go to YouTube and look at the different neighborhoods in Bali. Know what you're looking for. Do you want more of a foresty, um, out of the way neighborhood? You might want to go to Ubud. If you want to be in the limelight where everything is happening, you might want to go to the west to the west side, you know, the west side, you know, Changu, Seminyak. If you want more beaches, if you want more surfing life, you might want to go over to Uluwatu. If you want more a slow pace of living, quiet, where the retired expats live, you might want to go to Sonor. Um, if you're wealthier and you want the luxury, you might want to go to Nusa Dua or something like that. So, um, or out of the way, Jimbaran. So it really depends on what you're looking for. It depends if you're single. You know, I positioned myself in the west close to Seminyak um, and 
that is because the the resources the resources I have here from my child, she is neurodivergent. So the, the therapists that I have live around this neighborhood, the schools that I looked into are around this neighborhood. I'm in close proximity to other places on the island. If I need to catch up with my friends, if I need to go to the grocery stores, I'm like 20 minutes away. If I want to go to the mall, it's not too far. If mama wants to have a night out, it's not too far. We're close to the beaches. If if my baby wants a beach, a playground, and things like that for her to play in, we're close to a little bit of everything. So this place is really, really perfect for me. Um, initially, when I moved here, I wanted to go to Ubud because I'm a forest girl. I love the trees. It is beautifully, lusciously foresty up north. Um, it's a little cooler, but there is there are no beaches. Limited things to do over there. Limited things for your children to do over there. Limited schools. Um, there are things, but it's not as much as it would be towards the region that I'm living in. So it really depends on what you want. How has your transition been from the States to Bali? Okay, so I think, and this has been the case for a lot of moms that came here. There's a lot of single moms that are also living in the Bali, and a lot of black single moms that moved out here. I think it was like four of us that we moved simultaneously from the States um, without us knowing. Um, transitioning anywhere from an old way of life with your child is always difficult okay there's always an acclimation period is an acclimation period to the culture to the weather to to the the, the stress of even the food tastes differently right because it's so fresh and you're used to different things um the efficiency is not the same level as it was in back home things are slower you got to really learn how to be patient with yourself and patient with other people learning a new language learning a new way of navigating in this world um being on a bike being you know um communicating with ease um just so many so many variations and so and also your child you know integrating the changes being away from family being away from friends uh, different programming on TV, different hobbies. It's much more. We're much more outdoors. Don't worry, baby. So cute. Um, yeah. So you, the initial months were rocky. Finding the right nanny for my child. Getting comfortable with even having a nanny. Getting comfortable with someone being a housekeeper. Um, getting it the the transition was a little challenging with my child as with everybody's child this is the number one thing that i've heard from single moms is the exhaustion of finding the right resources for their kid um also if you're a black mom and your kids obviously are black knowing that there is a high lack of diversity on the island because all the kids here in all the international schools are, you know, they're white. Maybe you have one black kid here or there, but really not so much. So that could be a challenge too. Um, luckily, you know, it took us a couple of months to get into our groove. But with all of them, you will find your way. You'll get into a groove. You'll eventually snap into your own routine and the resources will come. And the more that you meet people, the more you put yourself out there, the more you ask for help, um, you'll receive it. So I've been very fortunate to, to anchor myself and be now in a comfortable position where, you know, I can rest everything is taken care of everything if i need a new resource i can easily get it it's not like you know because you're coming in as a foreigner you don't know anybody you don't know anything you don't know where to get anything it could be you know that is a challenging thing but um it's temporary all things are temporary uh why bali so i answered this in the beginning of the video um is it hard bali okay so so again a big part of me moving out of the united states aside from really feeling the pull and the spiritual calling is one quality of living i want my child to 
to be safe, to be happy, to be able to eat quality foods, not like lab grown foods, not things that I don't want to have to go to Whole Foods and pay $20 a chicken because it's not injected with hormones or things like that, or like the, the, the things don't have seeds in them, or she can't play outside because they're looting cars or they're shooting, and we don't know who's gonna try and come and get us, break into my house in New Orleans. I don't wanna have to live in a place where I need to own a, a gun to protect myself and then also get worried when my child starts to go to school, somebody's gonna shoot up the school because guns are legal. Don't wanna live in a state where they're banning um, birth control and it could be illegal I could be thrown in jail for getting an IUD you know and so there's things like that where I chose to move um I wanted safety was a big concern of mine also I wanted my money to stretch far um the money that I'm making my business I wanted to have a higher quality of life you know and make investments outside of the country um, you know, once you live, you leave the United States, you start to see how other black expats are living. You know, you start to mingle and ask them about their money moves, especially really successful ones, business owners, investors, you know, what they did to stretch their money, what they did to, to build a legacy, to build an empire for themselves and for their families. Same thing that our ancestors did in many different ways by starting businesses or working three or four jobs or putting money here, putting money there or buying a house and all that stuff or buying land. Um, so that's why I moved and chose Bali. Bali was just one of the first stops out of many that's gonna come on our trajectory. But is it hard being far away from what you've known your whole life? No, um, I would say I'm very fortunate with being a person that acclimates very quickly. Um, and you know, you just gotta roll with the punches and this is just not even with moving, it's just it's with life. Uh, people that can, you know, people who are malleable and can and bends and be able to adjust to changes and fluctuations in life and curveballs and plot twists those are the ones that are going to um evolve and thrive right and so for me it, you know if i didn't want to be here i don't have to be here and um luckily you know even though i've never been here before before i moved I did do a lot of research and I felt the vibes and I really liked what I saw and I liked the people's experiences and you know, I said, why not? You know, we try it for a year. We don't like it for a year. I can always go back home, but we love it. And so um, thankfully it's not hard. There's a lot of things that I miss from the culture. Of course I miss my family. Of course I miss my friends. Of course I feel like I'm missing out on things that we don't have here. But also Black and Bali does make up for a lot of that. I don't think, you know, I would have the same experience if it wasn't for the Black and Bali community and the Black and Bali event. So I will link them down below for you guys to follow. Um, if you're coming to the island, please hit them up because they're just incredible. And it's just, um, we also have a WhatsApp group where we're sharing our experiences or we're throwing parties or we're doing events or we're bonding and we're kicking and stuff. And so, it's like 400, 500 people a month that are in that group coming to and from Bali. Um, so I've met some really, really incredible lifelong friends on that group. So it makes being here much more easier as a black woman um, and a black parent. Skincare since the humidity changed. What changed about your daily schedule living here, there? Um, so really fun things about Bali is that you know, it's not that rural as people would think. There's a lot of places on the island that are rural, but we've got malls that have Sephora and have Korean skincare. And so that's what I've been doing. I don't do a lot of research on skincare because thankfully my skin is not that problematic. Um, but I have bought a lot of um, Korean skincare products that I feel have made a massive difference. The climate and temperature here is very much parallel to New Orleans. I would say New Orleans is much hotter, but it is humid. Um, it is hot. It is sunny. New Orleans definitely is hotter and swampier and more humid. So this is like a nice breeze compared to New Orleans. Every day is like 80 degrees or hotter. Um, sometimes you get a nice breeze. Sometimes it's not. Over here, the weather is just um, rainy season or dry season. And we're in dry season right now. And rainy season will be like um, monsoons, extreme rain, flooding, 
um, and that also varies on where you're in the island. It's less over here on the west side, more so up north. Um, but yeah, um, that's gonna be a little bit later on in the year. A lot of Korean skincare, a lot of moisturizing. The products here has a lot of moisturizing and water that your 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 skin needs. And I found I find that in the states, a lot of our skincare products really dry up your skin. So if you can go to an Asian community and get yourself some Korean skincare products, I definitely recommend it. Um, and obviously, with the skincare spas. Like getting massages, getting your nails done, this is so much cheaper than it would be in the States. Like, you know, um, getting a massage could be, getting a facial could be anywhere from like $20 to $40 if it's like a very luxurious facial with add-ons and stuff. Um, getting your nails done if you want like a press or gel and stuff, it could be like anywhere from $30 um your nails $30 toes or less than that depending on where you want to go I mean you could go to high-end places and they'll still be cheaper than the states and you can go to like regular standard dope ass places that are just as good and it'll be really way cheap so it really depends on where you go because the prices have changed too um people are like asking how you make your income I own a business I've owned a business for over 10 years now online and within the recent years, I pivoted towards more digital content, creating courses, creating a membership online. And that's what sustains my income, right? And so a lot of people here are on a very parallel path. I don't think I've met anyone that does digital courses on online memberships, but uh, my friend has an online concierge service. So she provides like luxury services to um celebrities or people that are coming to the islands or they are booking for a retreat she provides the services for that i have another friend that works in tele telehealth you know and so um he does physical therapy online um um a, a, a lot of friends work in tech a lot of friends are in like investments crypto um trading a lot of friends are digital artists, they're graphic designers, um, or some of my friends are writers. They sell, they'll sell books online, they do editing services, they host retreats. Um, so really, it's obviously all digital that allows us, or, or some people don't own businesses too, and they're just allowed to work from anywhere in the world because they just work digitally, right? They do conferences and stuff, things online digitally. So some of you don't even need to open a business. You just need to have a business that allows you to work remotely. Um, and that's good too. Um, <clears throat> how has Sahara adjusted to living here? Listen, Sahara's on cloud nine, honey. I think one of the, the, the challenging things for me was finding the right homeschooling teachers for her, tutors for her. Because sometimes like here, schools are very expensive, international schools. These are free for us back home, schooling, education, therapy services for special needs and neurodivergent kids are free, but they're not over here. So if you have, if you're an expat and you want to go to like an English speaking school, you're going to have to go to like a British or Australian based international school. And it's costly, man. <laughs> it's more expensive than you would pay in the States. Um... So I, you know, and, and they're not open year round. So they usually are filled to capacity when the school year starts because you've got so many expats living here that want to um, submit their kids to school. So in the meantime, we just do homeschooling. This homeschooling programs I do on the computer with Sahara or flashcards and things that we learn in her room. There's tutors that come and teach her. Um, I brought a bunch of workbooks from the States, so they sell workbooks here. So there's ways around it, you know, she's, she'll be entering kindergarten, so there really wasn't a need to have her go to school right away. I wanted her to really engage in her childhood and play. There's a lot of outdoor playing here. There's a lot of just, let's just go to the beach today. Let's just hang out at this uh, beach club with these friends, or we're gonna go to the farm. 
or um, we're going to go to the bouncy house or we're going to play in the pool. There's so many things like that for them to do, which is like, you know, uh, I grew up in Best Eye, Brooklyn, in the hood. So my pool was breaking a uh, fire hydrant and playing in the street and barbecuing in the projects with my friends, listening to Jay-Z and Nas and stuff like that. And some salsa. So I'm like, I'm very happy that she gets this really wholesome childhood. She gets to eat fresh mangoes from the mango tree, fresh coconut juice, uh, water um, from the trees. So, and, and she meets a lot of expat kids from around the world that, you know, um, are really dope. Her, some of her best friends is like this kid, this Russian kid from LA, um, this black kid from Cali, too. Um, you know, she, we have our home, our friends that live up north in Ubud. They've got kids that she plays with if she comes. You want to say hi, Zaza? Are you hiding? You want to say hi? I was just talking about you. You want to say hi? No, she don't want to say hi. Don't run with that in your mouth. Can you close the door? <laughs> um, what has been the most rewarding part of this move for me um the most rewarding part has just been me stepping back and seeing the fruit of my labor working so hard in my 20s to build this business like setting up shop at afropunk on the floor doing readings doing readings at tribeca film festival doing readings at events in best die not knowing how to you know, there was no social media back then. I think Instagram just started. And just seeing my growth and being able to like have this as a dream and have this quality of living for my child as a dream and being able to achieve it and see that it is possible and see so many black people around the world doing parallel things and living a different life that is very possible for us. And once you see an example, once you experience that example, you're like, it's possible. Think big, what else can I do, right? And so I'm very, very, very proud of myself. I'm very, very grateful for my business and all my clients. Um, I'm very, very grateful and full of love for the work that I do and how it transforms and changes lives and how it's just different work than what most people are doing out there. Um, I'm very, you know, happy and full of peace that my child is living this lifestyle. Like, my kid gets to tell her friends when she's an adult, oh, I grew up in Bali as a kid. Like, who, who as a black kid, who gets to do that? <laughs> like, you know? So that is amazing. You only hear this from, like, really well off white kids or something, you know? I grew up in Bora Bora or we vacationed there and it's like, yes, I am through the will of my ancestors and the support of my spirits and the support of my elders and mentors and my business and my clients, I'm able to do this. So thank, thank goddess. Um, that has been very rewarding. I can't, okay, the next question is tell us everything from flights to places and stays in hotels. I really got lucky because I had one month to move and um, I basically did everything on Google Flights. I just, you know, I just researched, like there is no shortcut. I can't tell you. I was on Skyscanner, I was on Google Flights. I found the cheapest flight. I think it was like $2,000 round trip for me in Sahara, um, 38 hour flight with a couple of layovers. Uh, I didn't stay in any hotels. I um, went on Facebook. Oh, when I first came, I stayed in a hotel, but there's so many hotels, so it's not like I recommend this hotel. I've only been on one hotel, and I don't even remember the name now. But there's so many, just do your research. Um, do your research, <laughs> that's all I can say. I am not a travel agent. Like I came kind of impulsively, and um, I do my research and go with that. But, um, yeah, as to how I found my villa, I went through Facebook and looked at the groups in Bali and I talked to some agents that I met there and, you know, they just PM you or they um, WhatsApp you and you make an appointment to see all the villas and stuff. 
And yeah, so, okay guys. So sign up down below if you want to find out more information about my upcoming retreat in Bali. This was a lot. I hope Saza, I'm gonna get Kadek in a second. Thank you so much for watching. Um, my child needs me. So thank you so much for watching. I will um, be in touch with you guys real, real soon. Thank you.